Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning. My name is Judd Devermont, and I am the director of the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Digital Currency and Remittances in the Time of COVID-19. This event was made possible through the generous support of Novi. Today's event brings together two issues that have been really the heart of the Africa program this year, digital transformation and navigating the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our conversation is gonna focus really on two challenges, one immediate and one longer term. First, we're gonna to try to think through how do we support and sustain these vital remittance flows to and within Africa during a pandemic and economic crisis? And then what is the potential of digital currency and other technologies to address this, passing, this pressing need? And then we're gonna focus also on how can these technologies support digital transformation and lead to greater financial inclusion? especially in a post-COVID world? What are the regulatory reforms that African governments, international partners, and the private sector need to implement to enable this change? Now, as many of you know, African governments have done a great deal of turning towards technology to help weather this pandemic. At least a dozen countries have waived fees and established more flexible measures to establish and open mobile money accounts. We've seen other forward-thinking policies as it relates to e-learning and e-health. And as Commissioner Abu Zaid has noted in other forms, COVID-19 is a clearing call for Africa to prioritize digital connectivity and governance. What's really exciting in my opinion is we're bringing together some very different communities. We've got specialists on technology and digital currency platforms. We have experts on remittances and then those of us who are just policy wonks on Africa. And so it is possible that in this discussion, we may veer deeply into one of these three specializations so useful to start out with some definitions. I think remittances is fairly straightforward. It's the sending of money checks to a recipient at a distance, either across international borders or domestically. Remittances are an incredibly important source of foreign funding for the region, has been in the past about $40 billion for Sub-Saharan Africa. And though there are projections that it will drop uh, because of uh, COVID-19, and we'll talk about that. The second definition is around digital currency which is a moving target, and we'll kind of get into some of the different ways people think about it. I like the definition used by Timothy Massoud, who is a senior fellow at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He thinks about digital currency as a government or non-government issued digital payment instrument in token form. Now that's distinct from electronic or mobile money payments that are linked to commercial accounts. But again, we'll try to unpack this during the conversation. Our goal really is to put a bunch of things on the table to understand the state of play and then to have an important conversation about the potential reforms to address this topic. Now, we are virtual, of course, for six months now, but your participation is so important to this conversation. So all you have to do is go to our website at css.org, click on our event page, and there's a link to submit your questions and we will bring you into the conversation as we wrap up. Now, let me introduce our esteemed panelists. We have the AU Commissioner for Infrastructure and Energy, Dr. Amani Abu Zaid. She was elected uh, to her current position in 2017. Immediately before this, she was the director of the African Natural Resource Center and held other senior positions at the AFDB. She has also worked with other international organizations on infrastructure and energy. She is a member of the Broadband Commission and the Stewardship Board for a System Initiative on Shaping the Future of Energy. We also hosted the commissioner on an episode of our Into Africa podcast. It was one of our best. We also are joined by Dr. Marie McCullough. She is the head of the Migration Policy Research Division at the IOM in Geneva. She's an international migration specialist with 20 years of experience in migration as a practitioner, program manager, senior official, and researcher. Marie is a senior fellow at the Global Migration Center at the Graduate Institute in Geneva and a Sir Roland Wilson Fellow at the School of Demography at the Australian National University. She is a member of MIT's Global Technology Review Panel, and uh, she also curates the World Economic Forum's Migration Transformation Map. And finally, Michael Kimani is the creator of Crypto Bazaar, 
He is an experienced mar uh, market builder of blockchain and crypto products in Africa spanning seven years, 10 blockchain projects across six African countries. His combined contributions have significantly catalyzed blockchain commercial government and policy activity across East Africa. Michael has worked with government, multinational corporations, startups, and nonprofit networks, earning him a reputation as Africa's number one blockchain influencer. Let's start with our conversation. Honorable Commissioner, I'd, it'd be really helpful if you helped, gave us a perspective on the importance of remittances and how you think the role of technology, what is the role of technology to really ensure these critical financial flows during COVID-19? Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jack, for the kind invitation, and uh, it's a real privilege to uh, join this uh, stellar uh, panel um, uh, and to join uh, Here you, we're touching on very important issues for Africa, remittances uh, and digital currency uh, or digitalization at large. I mean, for a continent of 1.3 billion, uh, billion people, the majority uh, of, uh, of whom are young, uh, Africa is poised for digital transformation that can change you know, our lives and can change the history and the path of development on the continent forever. And it is actually underway, I must say, this, uh, uh, this transformation and uh, with significant progress in many uh, foundational areas of the digital economy. Uh, digital transformation, of course, promises positive multiplier for socioeconomic trends, uh, uh, creating jobs, bringing uh, to scale uh, and moving beyond the islands of success to achieve deep, deeper transformation in all uh, sectors. Now, it, the COVID-19 uh, or the time where we are, uh, I, I must say that uh, Africa, African government have been very swift in including or introducing actions against the pandemic, not just individually as countries, but collectively as a continent. And we do have a, a, a common uh, a strategy uh, for resilience and, uh, and uh, recovery. We have uh, a common continental fund for, uh, to support you know, the different countries for uh, and the different actions to uh, uh, not only to contain the pandemic, but as I said, to recover and to recover better. And that's what we, uh, we, what we are aiming to do. Now, instrumental to the containment and the fight of COVID-19 on the continent is technology and a digital, especially digital technologies for trace and track, uh, for information, uh, 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 for exchanging with the with the patients um, uh, in in our countries here, I mean those who have mild symptoms, they stay home and they stay in touch with WhatsApp. For instance, they get the the, the needs and the information or the medication with WhatsApp. They deliver to their homes and so on and so forth. So it it is not simple. It's been really a true uh, 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 a fantastic tool uh, in terms of. Uh, 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 trying to deal with this unprecedented uh, pandemic, of course, this unprecedented crisis. But moreover, I mean, the use of technology in, in e-education, uh, our, our schools, all our schools stopped and our children were learning via uh, uh, this fantastic tool, which is dig digital uh, or e-learning. Uh, and I must be, I must say that uh, we are also grateful to our uh, operators, I mean the private operators, and because they waive the fees uh, for, uh, uh, for e-learning. So the children to access any platforms for learning, they, they will not pay in anything, same thing for health. So uh, everybody came together as governments and uh, as private sector, you know, to make sure that at, at this critical time, a time of great need uh, or crisis, that we are working together and uh, making sure that our continent and our people are in the safest possible uh, uh, situations. Uh, now, uh, it is then timely, uh, or we didn't plan, of course, we didn't plan it that way, but it so happened that in February this year, we have, uh, uh, our continent has adopted the digital transformation uh, strategy which we had developed you know, a year before with the help, of course, of the private sector, civil society, and all the uh, stakeholders. So it came very timely uh, that uh, at, at the, as the continent adopts a strategy to move together 
uh, and to have a harmonized approach towards this transformation across sectors, of course, minding the particularities or the specificities of each country, that uh, it came at a time where digital is really uh, of this importance. And we all know now, if you're not online, or uh, uh, being online is, is a lifeline now. So that's, uh, uh, that's how it goes. It also comes at the time when we are about to launch the African free trade area. And this must come in, into our conversation, but what, whatever, when we talk about payments, currencies, and uh, it, it, the, the, the end is what we want to facilitate the lives of people, make it better, but also make the transactions better. And uh, when we talk about transactions, trade, inter-African trade, is highly important. It was due to start on in July, and of course, because of the lockdowns, now it moved to uh, January 2021. So the importance and relevance of digital financial services becomes primordial as it would facilitate greater inter-African trade and put in place needed cross-border payment systems in the operationalization of this free trade area. It would also facilitate the transactions in, involved in other financial products and services like to deposit savings or make a loan or or have you know uh, 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 insurance? So transaction data produced by digital payments can also reduce informal asymmetry, uh, asymmetries between borrowers, lenders, and serve as useful input into credit decisions, including choices related to trade finance for small businesses. Now you may say, well, this applies to anybody, but it's more important for Africa, uh, and it promises more for Africa because we can afford to do the leap. Uh, not having a, a, a patrimoine, how to, a legacy, the lack of legacy very often is a great opportunity. So for us, we should take that leap. We should not, you know, follow uh, 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 or, you know, deal with the conventional uh, paths rather than to take the leap and use this digital, uh, 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 these digital tools, including in, the, in finance, to make that leap uh, and making use of the fact that we do not uh, have a, a, a legacy. Now comes remittances, and remittances. I'm sure Marie is going to touch uh, to, to to touch uh, to talk about that. She's the expert. But remittances uh, for Africa is, uh, a, I mean, the, the 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 amount of remittances to Africa is sometimes even more than the ODA, more than the FDA combined. So this is how important uh, uh, remittances uh, uh, are for, for the continent. We're talking billions of dollars, sometimes even more than $80 billion for the continent. And uh, please, when I talk about Africa, we don't have, for us Africans, we don't, we don't say North, South Sahara, and, and we don't talk like this. Africa is Africa, so uh, uh, all of it together. So very often, or uh, most of the time, Remittances represent the most stable source of flows, financial flows coming to the continent, having nearly a, a, a consistently increased in volume since 2010. For some countries, they represent 5%, uh, uh, and uh, for they can go up to 23% uh, of the GDP, like Lesotho, or, uh, or 20 or 13. So we're talking about huge amounts of money and pillars of the economies of, of our countries. Of course, the largest two recipients uh, would be Egypt and Nigeria. But that said, I mean, some countries, small or medium or big, I mean, or bigger, they, they, uh, the, the share of uh, remittances in the GDP is very important. COVID-19, of course, caused you know, havoc across the world. And the, the issue of, of, of remittances, uh, international, I mean, internationally, uh, has has stopped in some estimates is that they uh, going to uh, decline by almost sixty uh, percent. Uh, so it depends where you are. It depends uh, what is happening, uh, where the the migrants are. Uh, uh, the decline is is huge, with of course serious repercussions. Uh, and here I'm talking about the international remittances. It's even worse when it comes to uh, uh, within the country or within the continent remittances. Uh, because people seem to also forget that most of our uh, migrants are not outside the continent. They are within the continent. There's almost more than 130 million people, you know, uh, uh, across the uh, migrants across the continent. And these, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the accurate 
uh, uh, information or data about the flows, the remittances, of, uh, internal flows. But some estimates also is that they would be reduced by uh, 80% or more than 80%, mainly uh, between urban rural. And here we talk about the poorest of the poor. And uh, we talk about, you know, often the breadwinner, a man who would be in a city, for instance, and leaving the women with the children uh, uh, somewhere, or a young man and li leaving his family. So the implications also of women uh, is, uh, is, uh, is huge. Uh, okay, what the African Union is doing. I did talk about the uh, digital transformation strategy, uh, but also, by the way, we do have the African Institute for Remittances. Uh, it, 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 you know, they contribute to reduce the cost of data and, and to work, you know, with African governments in that uh, sense and the financial systems in the continent. I must say that the cost of transfer of remittances is very high on the continent. Of 7% and the aim and the target is 3%. So, but again, uh, this would be maybe touched upon later. Uh, we do have, we launched last year the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, which was uh, 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 also on this issue of interoperability and key for the diffusion of FinTech and mobile money services. But again, due to uh, what happened this year, everything seemed to be pushed to uh, 2021. 20, uh, there are other uh, 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 initiatives like the African Digital Financial Inclusion Program and uh, uh, the, the, fi the financial inclusion policies and others. But then again, I mean, this is at the level of the African Union, our government, some governments, you know, uh, they could be things happening here and there because it's not really um, uh, uh, homogeneous across the continent. So it depends really how advanced some countries are uh, with uh, with the draft of some some of these aspects. So going forward, we'll, uh, we're pushing again for uh, or more even for digitalization, financial inclusion as a way of empowerment of women and of the poor, uh, uh, the, the harmonizing policies, regulations, uh, making sure that. Uh, 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 this issue of interoperability, you know, is 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 operational and functional across the continent. Because we want to make sure that the also flows across borders are happening at the uh, 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 easily and smoothly and with the least uh, cost to uh, to those who uh, transfer money. Uh, digital financial services and remittances during uh, COVID nineteen is a very uh, relevant topic. Uh, today, and I really thank you all, and especially CSIS, for uh, putting this on the table and for sharing uh, with us the insight of so many experts. But also, uh, I'm sure that we'll learn a lot and we'll draw the uh, uh, very important uh, insight and, and lessons from this conversation. And I thank you, Commissioner. Thank you so much for that uh, excellent opening and lay of the land, and to learn more about how the AU is thinking about digitization, the transformation, and remittances. I know you have a very busy schedule today, so I appreciate your time. Don't worry, I'll come back. I'll report to you if we come up with any big ideas, but we're deeply appreciative of your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, and my team is here, so we will uh, we will listen to all the very uh, uh, um, precious uh, insight from, from the panelists. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, Marie. Um, we need you to walk us through a little bit more. <clears throat> Excuse me, let's build a little bit on the commissioner's comments about the importance of remittances to livelihoods. And then I'd love to hear about how um, the traditional ways in which money is being uh, transmitted and maybe how that's changing under COVID. So let me hand it over yeah. to you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Judd, and, and thanks very much to the Commissioner for that fantastic overview. It, it makes uh, certainly this presentation, which is really very much focused on the current statistics and research and evidence, a lot easier to present with that really fantastic big picture. And thank you very much to CSIS for, for really honing in on this important topic. Um, remittances, I think, is has always been important. We can see from the graph on the left there on the first slide, that is continuing to grow in importance. But I'd just like to underscore um, the aspects that the commissioner raised in regards to COVID-19 
and the importance of remittances as a frontline recovery and response to COVID-19. It's, it, it's so important historically to development and poverty alleviation, but what we're seeing in this really unprecedented global pandemic is that um, migrants are often on the front line, both in, uh, you know, origin and destination countries, but they're also being the frontline responders in many ways uh, in terms of economics and uh, development and response. So to provide some, I guess, graphical representation in regards to uh, the points that the commissioner raised in regards to ODA or official development assistance and remittances, you can see on the graph on the left that remittances for a very long time, the last two decades, has really outstripped uh, official development assistance. But we're also seeing a different trend in regards to foreign direct investment as well. This is a global uh, graph from the World Bank, and you can see the significant drop in 2020 forecast, uh, and that's directly in relation to COVID-19. So the World Bank is projecting overall for this calendar year, a 20% decline in international remittances. It's a little different for Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's probably worth explaining uh, to, throughout this very short presentation uh, in regards to the statistics, uh, the International Organization for Migration uses the UN regions, so as the commissioner said, the continent, so all of Africa, but a lot of the outputs are actually presented along the lines of the Middle East and North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. So we've drawn on the latest data and the latest research that really drills down most of the time into Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as well as MENA uh, and a different sort of construct. But for our outputs and for our kind of flagship publication, we do have a similar kind of approach to the continent of Africa. So just worth highlighting there. Um, what we're seeing in regards to COVID-19, and this is something that Judd mentioned to specifically point to in the context of the current pandemic, is we are seeing increases in inflows in particular countries where the data is strong and the reporting um, uh, platforms are, are strong as well, uh, such as Mexico, for example. I've highlighted a few there. We've found in previous pandemics, which have been more localised, not global, that this has occurred, but there is definitely the, the, the need to understand this better and the variation that we will see, because we know that it won't be uniform across the world, even though we are facing uh, a global pandemic. So that's certainly one area that, um, that would be very interesting to look at in terms of behavioural economics and how migrants are responding. As the Commission also mentioned, internal remittances in Africa are thought to far outstrip international remittances, although it's not well documented and understood at this stage. But we do know, we can still draw the conclusion that COVID-19 recovery will definitely depend on improving and increasing remittance flows, whether they are internal or international, and utilising a number of different uh, tools that have begun to be put in place but can be strengthened, which Michael will certainly go into. Here's just a very quick snapshot of the recipients of remittances. Uh, on the left is the global picture, and we've got the top countries as the commissioner mentioned, Egypt and Nigeria from the continent are amongst the top uh, receivers of international remittances. But it's also worth highlighting on the right-hand side of the PowerPoint there that we have high variability within Africa in regards to remittance inflows as a share of GDP. We can see that some countries down towards uh, the bottom there have very high proportions um, of you know, GDP uh, in terms of remittances and quite strong reliance, but it is highly variable, which will mean that the impacts in regards to the projected declines over time uh, caused by COVID-19 will be variable within the continent. In terms of mobile money and remittances, this is an area that we have certainly uh, been very interested in, especially in regards to supporting responses uh, and supporting very practical ground level and bottom up sort of approaches. 
uh, because we know that migrants are now outstripping, for example, um, ODA in terms of the international remittances, and we're seeing a shift in regards to FDI as well. So to be able to exploit and utilise the technology, I think, offers some great uh, potential for policy interventions that are very practically focused uh, on improving um, poverty alleviation, uh, crisis response and so forth. We can see from the map there that we've got very high penetration rates in sub-Saharan Africa in regards to mobile money accounts, largest in the world, of course, related to uh, traditional banking systems, not being as robust as other parts of the country, but also in relation to uh, the remittances that are received internally intra-regionally, as the Commissioner mentioned, so with other countries within Africa and also um, beyond uh, Africa as a region as well. We know, for example, from research and analysis over quite some time now that uh, the mobile money platforms have really made uh, remittance transfers cheaper and faster. And we know that they are also safer and they reduce exploitation because they're also uh, sort of traceable. Uh, we do know that there are, you know, a number of humanitarian organisations who are using mobile money for, you know, digital cash transfers and other kind of interventions. But we also have to be very mindful of the gender dimensions in regards to access to ICT and especially sort of smartphones and mobile money applications that go with that. So very briefly, the three sort of key takeaways that we can draw from the existing evidence base on remittances and COVID-19, although it's early days, uh, and Africa really go to the first key point that migrants are continuing to act as the drivers of human development and they have really outstripped ODA in the last uh, decades. They're starting to overtake foreign direct investment. They are really the drivers of uh, human development in so many ways globally. And despite the initial predictions, we have seen countries experience increases in remittances in terms of inflows during COVID-19. In some ways, this is a natural reaction during an acute period of intense pressure and uh, shock. International remittances will be sent by migrants if they are able to send them back home to help origin countries, their families and communities deal with those issues. We don't really know, and we are in new territory on this, the extent to that particular phenomenon uh, sort of globally, and we don't have insights really in regards to Africa, although they will be emerging and people are looking at this quite closely, including ourselves. In regards to COVID-19 recovery and recovering sort of better, uh, we do know that it will depend in part on increasing and improving the quality of remittance flows. This is so clear from the existing evidence base uh, it makes a lot of sense to have migrants and international and internal remittances factored into COVID-19 socioeconomic responses, for example. But one of the key barriers to that, of course, is cost. And as the Commissioner mentioned, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has one of the highest kind of cost regimes in regards to the transfer of international remittances. We also need to be really working with a number of different partners to harness some of the tech changes that we have seen, both Judd and the Commissioner mentioned this earlier, we've seen it occur uh, in the last sort of six months or so in regards to education, but there are some real opportunities for the, the tech community, the civil society organisations, UN agencies, the African Union, uh, as well as uh, member states to be able to come together to really look at platforms and ICT accessibility, including so that we can improve the lives of those who are most vulnerable. And here we're talking about displaced uh, persons, both those who've been displaced internally and across borders, and also uh, women. And we know from existing evidence in regards to migration that we're seeing more and more uh, young women um, and uh, migrant women starting to migrate independently rather than as family members 
for uh, migrant worker reasons. So to be able to assist strategically with the transfer and access in regards to uh, gender for mobile money platforms would be, I think, a, a very significant step forward in regards to gender equality and also human development. Thanks, Judd. I think I'll leave it there for the moment, but I'm sure we'll get back to some of these topics. Yes, thank you, Marie. That was fantastic. Michael, you may have the hardest job here. Um, as Marie mentioned, remittances will be key to the COVID-19 recovery for the continent. ICT will play a role, but there is a lot of diversity and options to think through how to do, how to do this, how digital currencies and other platforms can help with the recovery to increase remittances. And so for a very uh, layman's audience, can you kind of walk us through, you know, what is the state of digital currencies in the region? What are the impediments to adoption? And if you need to complicate my earlier definition of digital currencies, that's fine too. But um, help us provide a baseline so we can do uh, the remainder of our conversation between the three of us and our audience. I'll turn to you, Michael. Sorry, Judd. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And it was really great to hear from uh, Maria and the commissioner on the state of remittances, um, not just across the world, but also uh, in Africa. I think I'll, one of the interesting things that was mentioned is uh, how COVID-19 has affected different African countries and that uh, a lot of the, the remittances we, we are discussing here are also between intra-African countries. And uh, that's interesting for me because it means uh, if Africa, African countries are being affected by, the economies of African countries are being affected by COVID-19, then it means both the, re the recipients and the senders of uh, these remittances are being, uh, are being affected. So I think, that's worth uh, a deeper look into. Uh, so back to your question around uh, digital currencies. Digital currencies is really, really a broad term. Uh, it's, there's been a lot of discussion around it. Uh, even today, uh, there was uh, some announcement by uh, the former central bank governor of, uh, of India regarding uh, the role of central bank digital currencies, the role of private currencies like Libra, and the role of uh, more decentralized uh, digital currencies like uh, like Bitcoin. So the, I'm just going to use these three examples as uh, the definitions of what you can help you understand like what are uh, digital currencies. So uh, for example, uh, a lot of central banks right now, like in China, are talking about uh, central bank digital currencies. And what really, what they basically mean is just being able to issue uh, digital tokens uh, that can work on, uh, on applications like WhatsApp, that can work on the internet, but fundamentally they are backed, they are backed by uh, some, uh, some national currency, like the, Chinese, like, like the Chinese Yuan, or in the case of Kenya, for example, if Kenya did a central bank digital currency, it would be backed by the, uh, by the Kenya shilling. Uh, but there are also other types of digital currencies, and this is really one of the beauties of digital currencies is that, uh, uh, the technology, uh, which is a distributed ledger technology and blockchain that's underpinning these digital currencies, is really uh, democratic. So it's not just uh, uh, unique to the central bank. It also allows companies like, like Facebook and Telegram and these social media platforms that the commissioner mentioned, uh, these social media platforms that migrants use for communication. Uh, these companies can also leverage this technology to, to issue their own uh, now, I'm going to call them tokens, their own digital tokens. Yeah? And uh, because these are not central bank entities, they are private companies, it gives us another category of digital currencies that are issued by, by private companies. So that's, that's another category of, uh, of digital currencies. And another final category of digital currencies are the most controversial ones. Uh, I'm sure most of us have heard about Bitcoin. And these types of digital currencies are, are not issued by by, by a company that you may find in your jurisdiction. They're not also issued by a central bank. Uh, they're not issued by an individual. 
Uh, the best way to think about them is they are almost issued by by virtual communities, by virtual communities that have some some form of governance. Yeah, and Bitcoin is one of the most popular forms, but it's also given birth to a slew of uh, of other uh, other cryptocurrencies like like Ethereum, like EOS, like Bitcoin Cash, and that too is another third category of uh, of uh, of digital currencies. So when you talk about digital currencies, typically whether it's the IMF or it's the uh, Financial Action Task Force or whether it's policymakers, these are the three key categories that you're likely to, to come across. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I was just going to ask you to follow up a little bit on what, have, what has been the impediments to adopting digital currencies, uh, whether it's in East Africa, West, South, North. I mean, what is the way that governments think about any of these variations of digital currencies and sort of their, the opportunities and the risks? Yeah, so I'll, I'll pick up on the first question you'd asked, which was like the state of uh, digital currencies across Africa. Uh, before I, I move on to your second question about uh, how, how governance, governments and uh, maybe policymakers are responding to this. So uh, uh, digital currencies across Africa, I would say, uh, the ones that are most widely adopted right now is the third category that I mentioned, which are uh, uh, decentralized, they're sort of decentralized digital currencies. Yeah, and one of the reasons for this is they, they really don't require uh, any permission from anyone to, to use. So uh, they work a lot like from a peer-to-peer -peer perspective. Uh, you don't need like a, like a bank, like a banking service to access this kind of digital currencies, you don't need some ID form. And they have really lent themselves to somehow how our African economies work. So our African economies are, are super informal. Yeah, so uh, people are used to like uh, conducting businesses through relationships and trust and, and, and networks. And the fact that these digital currencies uh, work well between two people, allowing two people to come up with their own uh, means of negotiation, their own means of trust has really helped to, to grow and scale uh, these uh, this digital, digital currencies. Now, uh, this is something that the central banks aren't too pleased about, but they found themselves in a position where they don't really have much control because there is, these digital currencies are fundamentally uh, decentralized. Yeah, And if you look across the African continent right now, whether it's, it's Nigeria, whether it's uh, it's Ghana, which are in West Africa, or if you're looking at some countries in Southern Africa, like, uh, like Zimbabwe or South Africa, or you're looking at some countries in East Africa, which is where I'm from, like, uh, like Kenya or Tanzania and, U and Uganda, you find that the central banks have been issuing caution. Yeah, they've been issuing caution to, to members of the public and telling them, uh, guys, this, uh, these digital currencies that are decentralized, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, these, are, these digital currencies are not legal tender. So if something happens to you, if you happen to lose your money, uh, you, you can't come to us. You can't come to us and ask us to help you. So uh, that's really what the central bank, central banks, that's been the response of a lot of central banks in Africa to these decentralized uh, types of digital currencies. And, and that, that unfortunately, or fortunately, that really hasn't stopped the proliferation of this uh, digital currencies like Bitcoin. Uh, I'm gonna call them decentralized digital currencies. And it's because of the earlier reason that I mentioned. They, there's really no way for, for a central bank to come and intervene between two people who decide to transact in, in, in these types of decentralized digital currencies. And uh, if you go to Nigeria right now, this decentral, Nigeria is one of the leading markets. It's one of the leading markets. It's interesting that Marie, pointed out that Nigeria is one of the biggest receivers of remittances. I think it's over $21 billion. And Nigeria is proving to be one of the strongest markets for uh, decentralized digital currencies uh, right now in Africa. People are using them for, for payments. People are using them for, for remittances. And the market is, is exploding. Uh, so uh, this is the state of uh, decentralized digital currencies. Now. Um, I guess another bigger trend that's been happening is that the central banks across Africa and across the world have sort of realized, uh, wait a minute, uh, there's all this activity happening uh, outside our realm. And how can we tap into this similar technology and use it for 
our own purposes, perhaps to issue our own uh, central bank controlled digital currencies. And I think uh, the United States, for example, has been talking about something like a fair dollar. Uh, the Chinese uh, uh, central bank has been uh, experimenting and piloting a, a yuan backed digital currency. But African governments, I guess, they haven't really got to the point of uh, piloting or testing or building such digital currencies, but they have vaguely mentioned the idea of perhaps launching some of these digital currencies. And this is why I think they are, they are really in trouble because uh, they, it's, it's, it's seven years on, it's about seven years since these decentralized digital currencies came into the market. People have already started using them, people have already started adopting them. And yet the central banks in Africa are yet to even just come up with like white papers describing how they would go about launching their own digital currencies. So I think they really need to be careful because uh, um, decentralized digital currencies are sort of, uh, uh, they allow, they're, they're informal. So they allow a lot of transaction to happen that you, it may not be easy for the central banks to identify how much is moving between borders, you know, or how much, uh, how are people using these digital currencies? So I think they really need to, to step up their game and, uh, and see how they can maybe institute like frameworks for, for these decentralized types of uh, digital currencies and perhaps even launch their own uh, digital uh, currencies. So we are still waiting uh, from, from the central banks to see how they respond to this. Now, the final thing I'd like to say is uh, regarding uh, Facebook and WhatsApp and some of these large social media platforms which are home to a lot of African, uh, African people. A lot of young people nowadays in Africa spend close to four or five hours on WhatsApp. Uh, they're on Instagram, they're on Facebook. Like this is their major mode of communication on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's been interesting to see uh, such companies as well also push the idea of uh, launching their own private digital currencies for for, for use within these platforms, yeah? And uh, I think it's incredibly powerful that they're willing to do this and they're open to doing this because if you recall, the commissioner mentioned that a lot of migrants are using these social media platforms, especially now during uh, COVID-19, they're using these social media platforms to, to communicate with each other, you know, to, to keep in touch. Uh, they're forming groups where they have communities in, uh, to keep in touch. So I think for me, uh, from, a, from a technology perspective, from a product perspective, uh, I really feel like uh, the, 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 if you can be able to merge things like digital currencies, like the ones Facebook wants to put out, or even central bank digital currencies, or even decentralized digital currencies, with the communication channels that we use right now, uh, like Facebook and WhatsApp, then we can start to unbundle like some really interesting products that are not possible, that haven't been possible before uh, with, with the technology that we've been using right now, such as mobile money. So for example, you can imagine right now if two people are having a conversation across borders on WhatsApp and, and uh, maybe they, they want to send each other, maybe the, the, the man of the house wants to send back home to, to their family, he, he would literally have to step out of, uh, of his house and leave the conversation head over to a Western Union agent uh, or a cash agent, deposit some money, uh, send it, and then come back and pick up on the conversation. Whereas the possibilities that are emerging with these digital currencies, and merging these digital currencies with uh, social media, with uh, messaging platforms, is they could simply be having this conversation and they could instantly send value over that communication channel. That's just one example of the kind of products that are going to be possible because of this. So um, that's briefly the state of, uh, of digital currencies uh, across Africa. Uh, Facebook really faced a lot of backlash uh, when it announced that they, they'd like to do a digital currency. But I think for Africa, Africa really needs to be really careful how they, they, they work around this Facebook issue because a lot of Africans are on Facebook and WhatsApp and other Facebook products like Instagram. So I think we kind of need to find a, a, a midway point where we can work together and tap into the potential of uh, digital currencies embedded within, within these platforms to solve some of the problems that we have 
and and to come up with with new products that are good for people you know i call them uh people inclusive products that's great yeah thank you michael i mean and i've been reading and reading on digital currencies for the last couple of weeks months and i think that you had uh probably the clearest definition so uh, i appreciate it and i'm sure my audience does i should just say again that this event has the generous support of novi which is facebook's digital wallet but this event is not about that particular wallet or that or facebook but it's really about understanding the spectrum of options and how they can help us think through these issues around uh financial inclusion and remittances so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. I want to have a conversation at least for the next, you know, eight to 10 minutes with Marie and you, Michael, um, about how, where we go from here. And I'll just reiterate a couple of facts that I think we've said in the beginning and add a couple additional ones, which is the key issue as both Marie and the commissioner said is the high price of remittances on global average. It's about 7% in terms of cost for transaction, transaction fees. The SDG goal is 3%. And the World Bank has argued that we need to let national post offices, banks, and telecommunication companies get into the remittance space so that we can create more competition and lower prices. And the other thing that I, I think is really interesting when it comes to Africa, and I think, Michael, your comments allude to this, is there was a report by the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum uh, recently that, that looked at some countries and their openness to digital currency and South Africa was the only African country on this list, but more than 50% of South Africans say they have confidence in digital currency issued by major technology companies, so whether that's search engines or social media. And almost across the board, emerging countries, emerging the emerging world is much more open to digital currency technology than the developed world. So just, I think those are really important to sort of put down. What are we trying to do? We're trying to make sure this is safe and low cost, and we're trying to be open to the various options. And Marie, let me come back to you about how do you see this as a viable approach? What do you think are the challenges for adoptions? I know we've talked about gender. I'd, I'd love you to elaborate more. But one of the things that I experienced when I was in the US government is the issue of overcompliance or de-risking where banks are, are overly concerned or private companies are concerned about getting a foul of anti-money laundering laws or countering financing of terrorism laws. So there's, it seems like there are like three different bins that we have to think through. Like one is just the, can we get greater adoption by people? Two, how do we address socioeconomic and gender issues? And then three, how do we get companies and governments comfortable with doing this in a way that is inclusive and doesn't run afoul of all of these different laws that is country specific, but in general, they're all for the same goal, which is to prevent money laundering and the financing of terrorism or any sort of you know bad sort of behaviors that can come out of money that isn't as, as clearly transparent as others are. So that's a lot I just threw at you. What do you think? Mm. Thank you, Judd, and, and I, I think you've picked up on some of the key points and some of the key kind of tension areas that we have been grappling with. I mean, um, you know, countries and governments around the world uh, have been grappling with these sorts of issues. You mentioned the financing, for example, of terrorism, and that's that's an age-old issue in so many ways. But with new technology platforms, uh, it creates a whole range of conundrums. Uh, for, for both the tech sector, but also for uh, governments and for central banks and for policymakers and so forth. I'll just not really answer the question um, uh, in regards to specific regions or specific countries, but point to a couple of different trends that we are seeing that have been highlighted uh, in regards to the confidence levels, as Michael mentioned, uh, in regards to Facebook and the big kind of social media platforms being utilised for communication, um, you know, reasons for a whole range of different thematic areas, including including in regards to migration. Uh, but also the other trend, which we also know has been going on, and that is the lack of trust in regulatory regimes and authorities and governments around the world. And this is not specific at all to Africa, as we know, it's, it's um, definitely prevalent in Western democracies. And we have seen a long-term trend in regards to the reduction in trust. So our challenge and um, as you know, communities who are very focused on poverty alleviation and 
being very clear about remittances and what they can do and what they are doing from the bottom up is they are uh, alleviating poverty around the world. They are becoming really central to household incomes, increasingly so. They are being used from the limited information that we have at the moment in regards to COVID-19 and remittances. In some countries, we are seeing um, increases in remittance flows. So it's a case of trying to, and I'm not saying suggesting that that will be sustained, but because of this acute crisis situation, migrants where they are able to, where they have access to channels, remittance channels uh, that are you know, affordable and they have got incomes or savings that they can draw on, then we will see that people want to send money home to families uh, in the context of this pandemic. But the real challenge is to try and negotiate and work through some of those tension points so that we're not alleviating, you know, some of the really difficult uh, issues in regards to the transfer of money through different platforms, such as for um, aspects which are the most pointed probably, uh, you know, human trafficking networks, um, uh, counter-terrorism uh, areas are really focused on this as well, but, um, and contraband and so on and so forth. But um, uh, making sure that we can have a regulatory regime that isn't overly kind of um, uh, sophisticated in the sense of trying to reduce remittance flows and increase fees. So it's a very challenging area. It has been a, a, an area of considerable challenge and consternation over, over many years. But the pandemic, as I would point back to the Commissioner, the pandemic highlights this in real time and it does really allow us to hone in on the fact that we can see with the consistency of time that uh, international remittances, internal remittances, we need more data on, but we know that remittances are central to both shock uh, responses and crisis situations, as well as longer term human development. So it'll be a case of trying to work through and develop robust platforms that have sufficient uh, protection in regards to the users and the regulatory environment, but also allowing for, you know, greater diversity of remittance channels, for example. It's really helpful, Marie. Uh, if we have any questions from the audience, please send that in right now. We have about nine more minutes left. So Michael and I will have a quick exchange and hopefully we can get one or two questions. Michael, this is, this is a really hard question, admittedly so, but you know, when you think about the way banks and treasuries or finance and telecommunication ministers have been thinking about digital currencies, and I'll, I'll let you decide if you're talking about centralized digital currencies or decentralized, are there specific recommendations that you would make for them to think about how to unlock this op these, these technologies with, with doing all the things that Marie said so that the safeties are in place? And you mentioned it earlier, I'll just reinforce it. According to an Echo Bank study from 2018, 21 African countries don't have a policy at all on these sorts of issues. So it, it seems like there's a real opportunity for frameworks, but what's sort of, you're an expert on this, what's a guiding principle that, that governments should think about? Hmm, uh, that's, uh, you're right, it's a, it's a tough question. And you've already answered the question firstly by saying uh, there's a clear need for, for frameworks. Uh, I think the other thing I'd mention is right now there's a lot of uh, excitement around fintech technology, yeah, which is uh, like just a way to use technology to uh, to enable financial inclusion, to come up with new products that are relevant, uh, to uh, maybe try and even uh, lower fees in some cases because uh, sending money sometimes via mobile money is much easier than uh, than than using a banking system. Uh, the commissioner mentioned earlier as well about uh, the African free trade area, which is supposed to help Africans be able to, to trade and exchange value across borders. So I think one, one quick way that they could really do this is just looking at digital currencies as fintech itself. Yeah, because right now we talk, we talk about fintech and then we talk about digital currencies as two separate things, you know? And since we already have some momentum right now around, uh, around fintech and how fintech can, can, uh, can deepen financial inclusion across African countries, I think one quick win would just be not to look at them as two different things, yeah? Uh, because uh, digital currencies themselves enable new, 
new products, uh, new products that can help uh, some of the issues that Marie uh, mentioned. So for example, uh, um, right now a lot of families are having problems with, uh, with money and savings. And I think if you start embedding digital currencies into our communications platforms, into WhatsApp groups, we could start doing new products like products that enable people to manage money. Yeah, so that how can uh, a recipient and a sender be able to share the same wallet so that they can man manage their money better? Because right now there's not much money to go around. So I guess that would be the quickest way to, to kind of try and start resolving this. And that would help resolve some of the controversies around uh, digital currencies. So let's just say digital currencies and a uh, pack and parcel of, uh, of fintech, and let's just have one combined conversation. I really like that. And I think, Michael, you and I offline, we're, I think one of the things that we could do is help people think through some of the principles that you would want to have in that framework. Even if it's not policy prescriptive, you know, what are the ways in which we need to think about inclusion and how we categorize this technology? I think that would be really helpful. I'm going to give Marie the, the last question uh, because I think you so eloquently put this on the table and clearly our audience thought this as well. We had a question from Irene Mogi from Harvard who said, who asked, how can African governments in the private sector help women uh, increase access to ICT? Uh, it's a really good question and it's a, it's a challenging one, but I, I would sort of point to, again, something that I alluded to sort of earlier and that we have seen over time, you know, very clearly in some of the statistical data, and that is that we're seeing, you know, increases from the bottom up in regards to the utilization uh, and the production of international remittances from migrants. Alongside that, we're seeing changes in the way that people are migrating. It's sometimes called in um, the kind of the research, migration research kind of nerd community, if you like, uh, the feminization of migration. Um, and some people question that because when you look at the aggregate level statistics, you'll see that there hasn't really been much of a change between uh, the proportion of male uh, migrants and female migrants. But within that, what we are seeing is we're seeing more uh, young women, uh, older women migrating for work, especially uh, independently and not as um, a member of a family unit. So in some ways, people are actually taking um, action themselves and starting to engage in different sort of social and economic processes. Uh, this is pretty typical for migration in so many ways, including in relation to remittances, which have now outstripped, you know, official development assistance and also ch really significant changing patterns that are emerging in foreign, foreign direct investment. They are becoming a, a real driver of um, development sort of globally. Our role, I think, and, and certainly for, for states um, and for the private sector is how to, again, protect users, protect the recipients and the senders, um, but enable access to be, to be widened. So there, I mean, the, the commissioner mentioned the, um, the Institute on uh, Remittances in Africa. I know that they are doing a lot of work on this, but it has to be tied to the underlying kind of socioeconomic changes that are occurring within different communities, because it, the key is really enabling the ICT kind of infrastructure to be shared on a much more equal basis in regards to gender. We know that for some populations, for example, uh, men are twice as likely to own and have access to a mobile phone compared to women. Now that's not uniform, of course, I'm not talking about all of Africa, but, but the research and the evidence indicates that within some populations, it's a very significant issue. That's particularly pronounced for displaced populations, but not only in regards to uh, displaced populations. So if we can work together to really look at the evidence, understand that the issue exists to start with, and then formulate policies and practices, uh, specific initiatives for uh, women would go in many ways to enabling sort of financial literacy, as Michael mentioned, financial inclusion to be strengthened, which ties in very well in, in terms of um, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, but also key is harnessing you know that potential for a COVID-19 recovery and response which 
which in some ways is being led uh, by migrants, but in other ways, there are significant obstacles in regards to you know, economic climates, but also the tools that are limited uh, to certain segments of the community and different cohorts. Great, thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank you and Michael and the commissioner for joining us. I am, I think our program is at its best when we are talking through cross-cutting solutions to these really challenging, nettlesome problems. And this was a perfect example of the way in which we're trying to bring together lots of communities to deal with tough problems. So thank you again for your, your insights and your contributions. And uh, I look forward to doing more work and having more conversations about this important topic. Thank you. Thank you, Judd.